You know, we're not saying all that. In uh, Cayuga language, we're all sitting here tonight in the ancient territory of the Cayuga Nation. And uh, that means hello and thank you in a language that I'm so familiar with that I grew up with. Uh, as Robin mentioned, I had a couple of college degrees, but it wasn't the college degrees in my life that I was known for. And uh, it still seems to be a continuing story tonight, doesn't it? <laughs> so uh, tonight I'm going back. I'm taking every one of you in here tonight back to another time and place. And you're, you'll, you'll be here tonight in the present, but I'm taking you for a few moments back a long, long way into a different world. As she mentioned, I grew up in the house across the street. But even though my genealogical and biological parents were in this area, um, I had a different side to me and my personality that many of you know about from my childhood early on. At six years old, I was adopted into the Onondaga Nation on the Onondaga Indian Reservation in Syracuse by Ms. Delphina Logan, who at that time was the head historian of the whole Iroquois Six Nation Confederacy. So I was a very, very lucky person in my life to have such a wonderful teacher and mentor in my life. And tonight I would like to dedicate this lecture to her memory. She passed into the spirit world from us in 1978, but I know she's with us tonight and with me tonight as I speak about some of the things that, that she spoke about and have not been heard in over a quarter of a century until this very moment tonight. Among the, uh, the people of the Longhouse, we begin all our meetings, we begin them with a prayer to our Creator. And we call this our Thanksgiving address. It's always done in the native language, but tonight I'm only going to give you certain sections, an abbreviated version, because this is a very long opening address. But we give thanks that we come together, the human element of what we call the universe tonight. And we recognize not only our human element in our universe, but also all the things that are interrelated. We recognize all the winged creatures, all the birds that fly in the sky. We recognize all the four-leggeds, and we give thanks. That's one of the biggest words in the Iroquois language in ancient times until present. It's, it's Yahweh, it's the, that's thank you. And that is in every religious service right up until the present day from way back all those thousands of years ago. Tonight I'll be speaking specifically about the country and the territory of the Cayuga Nation. But in order to understand some of the history and culture history of the Cayuga, you need to understand an overall view of what is native history of New York State. Most of the native history of the state of New York has been written in books by non-natives. And so tonight, I'm going to share with you what we call an oral traditional history. You won't find some of the things that I'm speaking to you tonight written in any book anywhere. And that's because we do things among the native people through what we call witnessings rather than by uh, writing. That does not necessarily mean that they're not just as accurate as what's written on a printed page in a history book. Because right down to this day, the native people in the state of New York have always had and always will have their own distinct identity and culture. The first people in this country that I learned about during my generation in school were called Indians. Well, we got off to a bad start with that word because these people don't live in India. They live here in New York State and they live on this continent we call Great Turtle Island of North America. So right off the bat, we had a misnomer in this, in this word. Um, there are over 500 nations, independent native nations, residing within the continental United States today. Each one of them has their own unique history, their own unique language, and their own religion. All of those things are very important today to them as they were in pre-Columbian times. So at this time, we wish to give thanks to all those things which surround us. We give thanks for the clean air, 
We give thanks for the water that refreshes us each morning when we wash our faces. And we give thanks for, in our native language, onigonus, the waters that our Creator gives to us. When we look in our beautiful Finger Lakes country, we're always reminded of its first people because their names are on your waters. Each lake has a native name, and that's the reason, there's a reason for that. Here in the territory of Guayana, Guayana, the Cayuga Nation, a beautiful lake exists that you still call Cayuga. It's over 40 miles long. And on its shores, in ancient times, live what you call the Cayuga Nation. <clears throat> the Cayuga people are part of what the first non-native people came here were the French. And the French trappers and traders who came into the ancient towns of the Cayuga people in this area witnessed them doing different activities. And one of the things that they witnessed was a way that they sent messages from one town to another. And this was done by a means of a little notched wooden stick with shell beads on the end of it. The men were very good, good athletes and they could run 40 miles a day from town to town relaying the news of the day. And when they came into each one of these towns, they had a cry that they called, again, And the people came out of their homes to hear the news of the day. Just like in old England, you'd have a bell and they would go, hear ye, hear ye, and the people would come out of their homes. It was the same type of situation. And the French witnessed this in the 1600s and they called the people in this territory the Qua people or Iroquois. And so this is where we get the name Iroquois, and Iroquois comes from the French. They were the first people to come into this territory and witness this event. Later, as different European groups would come, they were given different names. The people were called the Five Nations from the five original groups that lived in this area. And later, a sixth group came, they would become the Sixth Nation. None of these names are names that apply to them personally. In the old language, we say Ganuses Cajeno. Ganuses is what we say when we speak about a longhouse, but not necessarily the longhouse you've studied about in your social studies books. It can be any extended building. So this ancient word, Ganuses Cajeno, means we are builders of our homes because home building is a tradition of the first people in this country. The raising of their families and the raising of the crops and the raising of their children is all tied up in one. They were not a migratory people. They were sedentary. They didn't jump around and live in tents and hunt buffalo. They stayed in one spot and when they raised their three sisters, their sustainers of life, the corn, bean, and squash, they would move their town a little ways, only maybe 15, 20 miles away because the soil wore out, and, but they stayed in one spot. And because they were able to be a sedentary rather than a migratory people, they developed their own religion, their own language, and a very, very specific culture. That culture goes back in this area 5,000 years before Christ and is very still much with us tonight. Our oldest burial grounds in this area are on an island in Cayuga Lake near Union Springs called Fronnac Island and the archaeologists have carbon dated that site at 5000 BC. Right near it, only a few miles down the road, near Union Springs is the ancient capital of the Cayuga Nation. At the time of the first French explorers, they discovered over 800 people there. And so in French, they named the place what we would call today Cayuga Castle. This is why on your maps today, and when you travel down your road, you see these words along your highways, Mohawk Castle, Seneca Castle at Geneva, Cayuga Castle, because in ancient times, these were huge towns. They were not villages. They were huge towns of these nations of people. And the only thing that the French people in their mind could liken that to was like castles on the Rhine River back in France where they came from. So that is stuck with us until the present day. And this is why we have those names on, along our roads that are the ancient trails of the Iroquois people in this area. The Cayuga people are one of the Haudenosaunee. Haudenosaunee is the native word that means the people of the longhouse. <clears throat> Within each group, Mohawk, in the Mohawk Valley, we call them Kanyegehagage, and that means 
the people of the eastern door of the longhouse, the Oneida, Oneantayonawage, the people of the standing or upright stone, Onendagegas, Onendaga, the people on the hills, Cayuga, Goyantgwantanoges, great pipe people, Seneca, Nandawayawage, great hill town people, and later the Tuscarora, who came in 1713 and joined as a support and became the Six Nations. You're living tonight in the area geographically that was the most important Native American complex north of the Gulf of Mexico. The territory at their height of the Iroquois people extended from the banks of the St. Lawrence to the hills of the Carolinas and the land of the Cherokee and the Smoky Mountains west to the banks of the Mississippi. In the course of their history, they adopted in many groups from the south. Many things happened to them in the intervening years before the first European contact. I learned as a very young person that three gifts were given to the native people. One of them was smallpox. It hit the Onondaga and the Cayuga in 1660 and decimated their numbers. It came from the Spanish who were invading the Alabama country. In 1665, the Seneca Nation was almost wiped out by the smallpox that came to this territory from Alabama and Mississippi. <clears throat> we have as late the very first incident of bioterrorism in the United States perpetrated against the Eastern Woodland people here with the giving of smallpox infested blankets in 1779 by a fellow named General Amherst at where we call Pittsburgh now Fort Pitt. They brought a lot of different so-called gifts to the native people and so um, we don't have a huge amount of native people left in New York State but the numbers are growing. Tonight we have more Native Americans residing in the boundaries of what we call the state of New York since we had since the days of General Sullivan's raid against them. And I'm going to speak about some of those events tonight from the native viewpoint. One of, one of the things that happened here in the Cayuga country very early on in the 1600s at the first time of European contact was the advent of the Jesuit missionary influence. Each one of the native groups in this area has a very strong, cohesive religion, a native religion of their own, which they practice to this day. I am a practicing member of what we call the Great Law, the Ganatsi and Ogawe. Those laws were given to the native people by their creator. I have the great good fortune to be one of the only people that have a drop of white blood in them that is admitted to the Onondaga Nation Longhouse for its services and for its funerals and weddings at this point in history. And that's because of who raised me. The Onondaga, the, the Mohawk, are the keepers of the Eastern Door. Their territory stretches from Cohoes Falls near Albany to Fort Stanwix in Rome, New York. And in that valley in ancient times and up into the 1600s came the first missionaries. The missionary influence still plays a big effect among the native people today. The Mohawk at that time had three towns, Bear Wolf and Turtle Clan, and those are their three clans to this day. I want to speak a little bit about clan system because it's still so important to the people today. When you're born native, you are born immediately into the clan of your mother. They are what we call in anthropology a matriarchal society. And the clan system is one of the most important things that we still have from the ancient times that our creator gave us that gift. The male side of the family is almost totally useless in Iroquois society. Their males are really quite dysfunctional. And the power of the Iroquois people to this day lies in the female element. And that is because they are the life givers from Mother Earth. It's they who plant the corn and the bean and the squash. And they are the ones who give us our life and our sustainers. And so to this day, the clan mothers, the oldest women in whatever you clan you belong to, are the ones who elect the leaders. The power of the government lies in the hands of the female element to this day. 
Even in ancient times, no nation could go to war without the consent of the women against another nation. We're reminded of that later on in Amelia Bloomer and Suffragette Times on the site of Seneca Falls, New York, which was a town burned in General Sullivan's raid in ancient Cayuga town called Scoyaces. And in that town, many of the clan mothers elected their chiefs and controlled the power of their government. It would take the Europeans another 300 years to come up with that idea of checks and balances. And in our clan systems, we divide our clans between the animals that live in the water and the animals that live on the land. I'm a member of what you would call in English the sandpiper or the snipe clan. The Cayuga have 10 clans. Some are common. There are three nuclear clans to each of the five nation people, bear, turtle, and wolf. Each nation has those. Those are what we call nuclear clans. And these clans are so important not only in tracing family genealogy and record, but also in transmission of knowledge from the past into the present. We have an oral traditional history, everything that we need. The native people know who their ancestors were 700 years ago. And I don't think any of us in that room would know who our 700 years ago relation was, but if you, you really speak to an informed Seneca, they can tell you. So, <clears throat> The clans play an important role and still do. On the Onondaga Nation territory south of Syracuse, where I was partly raised, is the capital of the people of the Longhouse, the Six Nations Confederacy. Each autumn, since time immemorial, all of the nations gather at their Longhouse on their reserve land, and we hold what we call Grand Council in English. At that time, no matter what important overall situation happens, it will affect every native person living within the boundaries of New York State and all the Iroquois reserves in Canada. The government and the religion and the language today is the strongest that it has been since the time of General Sullivan's raid. We have more native children today speaking fluent Cayuga, Seneca, Mohawk, and Oneida than we have since the Revolutionary War. The longhouses, once again, are filled with the people giving praise to their creator through their songs and their ceremonies. And so tonight I come to bring you good feelings from the people of the Longhouse that despite 300 years of forced assimilation and acculturation, government run boarding schools, missionary influence, whatever it was, the people of the Longhouse survived tonight and are stronger than ever this evening. They will continue to do so as long as they live by what we call Natsa Nagawe the great law which was given them by their creator. I was asked to speak a little bit tonight uh, in particular about the Cayuga and in order to speak about the Cayuga nation we, we have to understand it in reference to the others. The Oneida, the people of the Standing Stone and the Cayuga are what we call the younger brothers because their populations were not nearly as large as the Seneca which today still have the most populous group in New York State. <clears throat> in the 1600s, Sayon uh, Gawes, their chief, met with the very first missionary, Father Stephen de Carl Heil, on November 6, 1668, at the capital of the Cayuga Nation, Goyant Gwentbuck, at Union Springs, New York. At that time, over 800 Cayuga people lived in that town, and they readily accepted the word of Jesus and many of them became almost overnight Christians since the 1600s. Among, among the Iroquois there's very little difference in many aspects of their, their native religion. But I want to speak tonight about this religion because many of you have misconcepts or you, you have grown up in a time period when it wasn't readily available for you to have authentic knowledge of certain things. I've heard many, many things. I've heard that Indians are uh, pagan savages, that Indians worship many gods. Um, I have never ever come in contact with any native people in this country um, that I can ever say had anyone but one creator. And they may have different names among the Lakota and the Dakotas. Um, he's known as Wakantanka, the Great Holy Mystery. Um, 
here he is the Archaeowagon, the holder up of our heavens. Um, but no matter what native nation we're discussing, there's only one supreme being. And that supreme being is the same for all races and colors of a human element on Mother Earth. And we recognize that. We never ever in native religion in our longhouses put down any other denomination or country's religion or color. It's against our way of life. And so, um, the Onondaga, or I grew up, Onondaga is what we call, for lack of a better word, the most traditional of all native reserves in New York State and have the most members following the longhouse, but I have many, many friends on native land in New York State of every denomination. I have friends that are Mormons, Senecas, Seventh-day, Oneidas. I have every denomination that I call friends. And yet, to this day, no one kind of likes to take a chance because a lot of my friends may be Episcopal or they may be Presbyterian or whatever, whatever denomination. But number one, they're still native. So they can go back into the longhouse whenever they want and participate in their religious services. In the longhouse, there's no separation of church and state. The longhouse represents our form of government, our form of religion, and our way of life. Those, those three elements were given to the people. And so this is why it's so strong today. <clears throat> the Anandaga, the, the, the church, for instance, with the most congregation today, uh, are the Episcopal Church. And that was because they didn't come to force the Christian religion 150 years ago on the people. They came to give them help. They came to give the Anandagas uh, tools to get along with in the dominant non-Indian culture and white society. So they were the first to teach the Onondaga reading, writing, arithmetic, and educational skills. And it won over their hearts, and that's why their congregation is the biggest today. Um, each reserve in each nation is very different. But all have members, and all have longhouses in the middle of each one of their reserves that are their centers of, of worship. <clears throat> Language Religion are two of the cornerstones of any building block of any culture. And this is why it's so important that they are intact today. The Cayugas are no exception to that rule. The Cayuga history is long and beautiful. In this area, the bones of their ancestors lie in sacred burial grounds scattered throughout Tompkins County, Cayuga County, Seneca County. Their ancient burial grounds are not marked by by Christian headstones or marks that tell you who this was and when they passed. But we know where our ancestors are. And in the springtime, natives will go to those ancient spots and give communion to our ancestors through the use of tobacco. Tobacco is a gift from our Creator. It's not used just for pleasure and enjoyment as it is among Europeans. Our Creator told us that through tobacco, we send our prayers to Him. And so in the longhouses and the ceremonies that I'll be telling you about, one of the first things that's done are tobacco burning ceremonies. And Anandaga is continued as among the Cayuga and Seneca, what you call their ancient or old festivals, which are based somewhat on nature. The first that we have is what we call Ganet Dahawagis, and that is midwinter ceremony. It's the Iroquois New Year's. It doesn't last like one night of drinking and fun and partying. It's a religious service that lasts 15 days in a longhouse. And each day is a separate thing that is done for the Creator. One day is Children's Day when all children born between August and the Green Corn Dance is given their native names. During the morning services are conducted from sunrise services until midday. In the evening prayers are done through dancing. And I want to speak a little bit about this term dancing because again, it's very different. Most of you in this room, when we say dancing, we think of having fun and going to a party or enjoying ourselves. But it's very different for Native people because when you see them doing these activities like so-called dancing and the activities that say the Indian Village at the New York State Fair or where you get a chance to see Native people doing their social dancing. Um, even the social dancing, which is different than the religious dancing done in the longhouses, there's, it's still a communion. 
When the women dance, they never lift their feet from Mother Earth. And that's because the soles of their feet are being blessed by our Mother Earth. They're blessing the female spirit, which will help grow corn and bean and squash and give children for the future. This is why that's what they're doing in something like the women's shuffle dance or the women's stomp dance or whatever, quote, dance they're doing. So it's very different. And I don't think many people probably that are sitting here tonight have had a chance to hear a little bit about what I'm going to, to speak about. But when you grow up native, it's very, very different, I guarantee you. Uh, you're looking at a fellow standing in front of you tonight that has a conflict of interest in his head and always had since he was the time of a little boy concerning American history issues. Um, I sat in Newfield School in second grade and uh, looked at a picture of George Washington over the blackboard and the teacher said, um, this is George Washington and he's the father of our country. And little Roy was not happy with that statement and put his pencil down and the blood was kind of coming up in his neck and, and uh, I looked at Mrs. Shoemaker and I said, well, he may be the father of your country, but he's not the father of my, my country. And guess who was in this country before him? And um, I said, we call uh, George Washington Hunnett the Gaius, and that means town destroyer. And uh, he is the one who sent General Sullivan to our territories. And when General Sullivan was done, there was 160,000 uh, bushels of corn burned. 40 towns, including all the towns on the shores of Cayuga and Seneca Lake. And um, from that day forward until tonight, whenever we have a president that is elected, uh, a letter is sent from Onondaga because our government is sovereign and separate from that of the United States. And uh, a letter is sent from the Grand Council of Chiefs at Onondaga to each incoming president. And it states on the Onondaga Nation letterhead, um, from the Onondaga Nation, Grand Council of Chiefs, to the current Onondaga of the United States of America, with every new president who comes in. And we have made sure that that continues on down. And I, I, I don't have a ton of time to talk tonight about politics, and uh, I, I don't want to anyway. And I want to, uh, you know, discuss other things tonight, and we only have a limited amount of time. So with that, I want to begin a very short slide presentation of about a dozen slides to tell you a little bit through a slide presentation here very quickly some things. Is this the start of these lights yet, Robin? This is about it. This is about it? Okay. Let me see. You know, I'm not the most mechanical guy in the world here. But, um, okay. All right, what we're viewing here is uh, Frontenac Island in Cayuga Lake off Union Springs is the oldest Cayuga, uh, well, actually pre-Columbian burial ground in the state of New York. There's not a whole lot left of the island compared to what there was in pre-European times. Most of the archaeological investigation would be submerged underwater at this time. This site is dated at 5,000 years before Christ. Um, over 75 skeletal remains were dug um, by the state archaeologists on this island. One of the most interesting features of that particular archaeology dig was a bald eagle, which was interred in a child, a burial grave of a child. Um, as Robin stated, um, during the 1970s, my adopted mother had destroyed the Six Nations, was um, building a recreated pre-Europoian pre site, a Wasco Lake, Auburn, New York. And uh, the Wasco culture is one of the most ancient in the state of New York, the oldest uh, intact pottery vessel ever found in the state of New York was found on this site and this was a reconstructed village that um, my mother helped uh, build and um, and which I was a tour guide during my college years for groups from Germany and foreign countries as specialists on Iroquois culture history. And there's an upside down slide. I didn't quite that But anyway, um, this is just one of the houses being constructed. Um, here we see a group of students from Germany that have arrived and um, they're learning about the Longhouse Way of Life from some of the reenactors here on the archaeology here. Um, this particular one was on um, fire building to learn how to uh, tan leather. And this is the gal that raised me. This is my mother, Miss Logan, I want to say. And uh, had this story of the Six Nations. She, um, 
she was uh, had a historian of the Six Nations. She was out. She worked on seven museums. She helped fund the Iroquois Studies uh, program for Rochester Museum in 1935. Under Dr. Arthur Parker, who was a third generation descendant of Red Jacket. Um, she was a direct descendant of the most famous of all Cayuga leaders, Chief Logan, um, who was orator um, of the Six Nations, whose entire family was massacred by white people at Circle Bell, Ohio. Um, his whole first family was wiped out by the Ohio militia. And um, she's a direct descendant of the second marriage. And um, Ms. Logan, I used to work with her. Uh, I, I lived with her on the reservation for 30 years until I uh, I buried her with the chiefs on the reservation, and her brother um, was buried next to her, and he was also one of the head chiefs of the Confederacy. Here we see a, a box lacrosse game going on on an Onondaga Nation. Um, I wanted to speak a little bit, somewhat. I know sports are really important to a lot of the fellows here tonight, and um, box lacrosse is a game that was invented by the Iroquois people. Um, the, the lacrosse is not, uh, serves a lot of different functions. It's not just a sport and an athletic game. It is that, but it's also a re of a religious nature. And uh, the lacrosse game is a direct gift from the Creator Himself to the to the Native people. And so when they play lacrosse, they are also giving a religious service besides performing an athletic event. So. Here we have um, a very unique game. This is... Um, the national sport of the Iroquois since ancient times, and it still is today. Um, lacrosse is referred to in a kind of a language as Bajikwa'a, which means a double duck fist. Here we have the Wasan Gases, which is a the Wasawane, uh, a, a big snow snake game. And what happens here is uh, two teams of men compete in the national winter sport of the Iroquois. Now a telephone pole chopped in half is, is dragged in snow if the snow can get at least three feet deep. And then pails of water are thrown on it, and you will see that in this man's hand, he's holding what we call a snow snake. It's a long, slender scale with a lead point on the end of it with the head of it shaped like a snake. And who, uh, this is a man's betting game, and whoever shoots the snake down this trap, the furthest wins this game. In ancient times, it was a, quite a betting game. They would, they would bet deer skins and whatever, and it became a national winter sport, and still is played on every, every reserve to this day in the state of New York and Canada. And we see another uh, Onondaga on, on the reserve, and I'm sure he's practicing in the winter. Um, in the ceremonies in the long house, um, the midwinters is our, our first one, and that um, is shortened a little bit since ancient times, but that's one of the main, uh, the two main ones are the midwinters or New Year celebration, and uh, the Green Corn Dance in August. At the midwinters, um, some of you learned about the um, the false faces in school, and at that time that people go from one house to another and conduct ceremonies where they stir ashes in the fireplaces and bless each house um, by stirring the ashes in the fireplace, and uh, each house is blessed for good luck for the new year. Um, the person in the red shirt with his western headdress on, which is not not Iroquois, uh, we don't wear western headdresses in a longhouse, but this was at a social event. And at the time this was, picture was taken, about 1958, 59, um, you know, you weren't really an Indian by anybody's standards unless you had on a, a western headdress. And so uh, anyway, that happens to be Chief George Thomas, who was head leader and spiritual leader at Onondaga of the Six Nations for over 40 years. And um, he, it was a, it was a, it's a Western drum, a Western headdress, and actually this was something that was done for the museum, and they wanted everybody to dress Western, so they did. But there's nothing on the dog about the picture except they're all full blood on a dog in the picture right here. This is one of the socials in the long house. Um, the next, the next one after the uh, midwinters is the uh, thanks to the maple, which is a one-day event, and, and we bless the maple tree. The maple in ancient times and still is um, the one that gives us the maple syrup. And so if you ever go to a maple sugar festival, you can thank the first people in this territory, the Iroquois, for that festival. And um, that's a blessing and a thank you to the Creator for the first, uh, the sap, which is the first sweetener of, from Mother Earth in the spring. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the other, the other festivals. Um, 
Christmas festivals are still intact. In August is the Green Corn Dance, and um, all six nations still perform the Green Corn Dance. And then uh, we also, I forgot, we also have in June, we just got done with the Strawberry Festival, which is a uh, one day thing to the strawberry. In the Iroquois religion, the strawberry is the most sacred plant. And in the, uh, what we call Angwahoe Ka, which is a native way, um, we give blessing to the strawberry as sacred, which is the little wild strawberry that grows in the woods. And um, in ancient times, the girls would have a special basket they made and go into the woods and gather these little strawberries and they make like a jelly in a lawn house and each piece in this person in the, in the, in the ceremony is served a little piece of this um, strawberry. And um, it's sort of like a communion type thing in the Catholic religion, you can liken it to that. And um, the strawberry um, is sacred because in the old Iroquois religion, um, the pathway of our Creator is the Milky Way. And when we pass, we don't really pass um, in, into the spirit world immediately. I, I know, uh, you know, like when someone goes, we go to the church and we have a service and all the relatives gather and the people all say their goodbyes in their heart in however way they do it. Um, in the, in the native religion, um, most people that live on a territory like, say, Onondaga, it's a, a lot like Newfield. They're all kind of like related to each other. They all know everybody's business or whatever. And so everybody kind of knows what's happening, as I recall. <laughs> and so, uh, um, you know, we all kind of feel like sometimes like, oh, God, how they were fighting it out. But anyway, um, <laughs> um, they, they still... Uh, they, uh, when someone passes, say, on a dog, it doesn't affect just the immediate family. It pretty much affects everybody that lives there because everybody's either related by blood marriage or somehow they all know each other anyway from generations back. And uh, so funerals are, in general, like really large. Weddings and, re uh, and funerals are really large on almost all Iroquois communities in New York State because of this. And um, to tell you a little bit about the native religion, which... Uh, most of you are probably not that familiar with. Um, the Milky Way is the pathway to the Creator. And when someone passes, or someone is ill in a hospital, the old phrase is, he or she almost tasted strawberries, which means they almost went. And so that, that's an old term that the elders still use, and some of the young ones. And um, we're always worried about somebody when they're that ill. And, um, when, when they go, um, no, no Iroquois ever feel, fears death or dying because we don't look at it as a termination. We look at it as a beginning. And we feel that all the people that are with us, are they're all watching us right here tonight. I know I'm, I'm feeling very odd. <laughs> like right now tonight, I was telling Robin because I lived in the house across the street from this building for 30 years of my life, okay? And so it's almost kind of surreal, but I know that all my crew is with me right now. I know my Uncle Al is watching me, and I know my mom and dad are here. I know everybody's right here watching what I'm saying and doing, so I better watch out what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, um, I, I always kind of like, whoa. And um, <laughs> you can feel them, you know, you can, I know all of you do, I know that even if you don't admit it, you have times when it's almost like deja vu when I thought, I've seen or heard or done that before or whatever. Well, this is what the Iroquois do. The Iroquois congregate at their council house, at the long house, for all their funerals if they belong to the old traditional religion, and they all get together and a speaker will get up and no English is allowed to be spoken ever in the long house. So all services have to be conducted in only whatever it is, Mohawk or Seneca or Onondaga or whatever the person was. So because in the native religion, there are phrases and things that are in the native language that cannot be, I guarantee you, they can't be translated into English. There, there's just no English words to express what is being said in some of those services. And um, I recently had... Um, a good friend passed uh, about a year ago, and I was in the Onondaga Longhouse with 900 people for the funeral, and the overflowing out into the parking lot. And um, and 
I began to remember some of those phrases from when I was a kid in that religious service and it affected me very, very deeply because I don't really have a chance, you know, I'm just here and there and, and I'm busy in my business and then I come back here and then I have like a really good feeling about being with all of you here tonight and I have a good feeling about being like in the lawn house and, um, and I remember some of those phrases from my, when I was a, a young boy. And when a person passes, we don't feel like I said, that they're just totally gone. We have a period of, we, well, the service is a certain service. They go out and the person is like officially, say, buried, what you would call buried in the cemetery. But we don't just finish there. We, we continue on. We, we, in, native, in native services in Cayuga, um, there are phrases like we say, at this time we've come to the edge and we put the casket in the ground and we say, at this time in our heart, we've come as far as we can for her, she or he at that time. But we know that we will see them, you know, in the future. And so at this time, the uh, and that we always thought that saying that we ask our, our mother to embrace her and enfold her in her arms at this time until our eyes meet upon one another again in the spirit world. And so um, it's very moving and very deep when you understand the religion in the old language. And um, I'm bringing up these things to you, which are kind of private and personal, because I want you to understand how important that still is to all the Native people in New York State this very minute, this very night. And um, I, I'm really happy that that is continuing for those people tonight and, and tomorrow and whenever. And uh, the, the Milky Way is the pathway to the Creator. And like I said about dancing, we don't really feel it's dancing because we're communing in, in our services with our Creator. And so the Spirit dances up the stairway of the stars of the Milky Way. And as the person who passed dances up the Milky Way, they stoop down and they have a song that they sing. And the path into the arms of our Creator is strewn with wild strawberries because that's our most blessed planet. And so as we dance into the arms of our Creator, we stoop down and we sing a song. And that song is a blessing that we're on our way. And we, we pick wild strawberries and we pop them in our mouth from one side of the path of the Milky Way to the other until we reach our Creator. And then our Creator engulfs us and enfolds us. And uh, we're there with all our relation and we're there with everybody and our families. and. Uh, you know, and we're just having a good time forever there. We have, if they, you know, we we have unlimited fishing, and we have unlimited hunting, and everything that we wanted in, in the material world is given to us there. So in the spirit world, everything is really cool. So no Iroquois ever fears death because it's a better plane of existence that we're going to. Um, the Cayuga people, um, in their history on the shores of this lake, um, adopted in a number of groups from the south in their history. One of the groups that they adopted in, and they really needed to at that point in their history due to their uh, epidemics brought by Europeans and disease and, and, and fighting and all the other things, um, they adopted in not just individuals but whole nations of people to strengthen their numbers. And uh, one of the groups that they um, that were brought messages up. There were quite a few that came here from the south. And uh, some of you know some of their names and some of them are kind of lost in history. Um, Nanakoke, Meharin, Kanoi, Tulo, Shaponi, um, and those people all sent wampum bead strings here, it's what we call invitation strings, and invitation strings were sent back to them to begin their northward migration as the Europeans were encroaching on their land in the south and massacring their women and children. And so as a European encroachment proceeded in the south, they sent message here to the Longhouse country and to the Cayuga country and Seneca country. And um, their migrations began from the south in the 1700s. And um, one of the groups that came here uh, to this county were, from down there were the Saponi. And, um, they were settled out near where Alpine Junction is now, under what we call the Hawassan, that's the wing of the Cayuga Nation. And so this is why you have this valley south of this town tonight called Pony Hollow. It comes from the Saponi Nation who was adopted into the Cayuga Nation. Um, 
another group that came were the, at that time were the uh, Tudlo people from the Carolinas who were also being wiped out by the European contacts. And so the Cayuga also brought them in. And they settled down at De Horisca Nadea, um, opposite Buttermilk Falls. And um, during Sullivan's time, there were 25 cabins and long houses on that creek. On the Sir William Johnson map of 1747, it's listed in the Cayuga Nation language as De Horisca Nadea. In, uh, the, in their language, it's uh, Korkarganel. Uh, Gargarganel means where we keep the pipe of peace. It was burned to the ground and destroyed during the Sullivan Raid on September 24th and 25th, 1779. Um, I want to speak a little bit about troubled times. Uh, some of you I know have asked, uh, Robin asked me to speak a little bit about um, the Revolutionary War time period and its influence on us tonight here. Because it does affect each and every one of you in here tonight, whether you understand it or not, but it does. And um, currently, the state of New York is under Native American land claim from every indigenous native um, group in the state. There are land claims against the state of New York from uh, Mohawk, Oneida, Onondaga, uh, Cayuga, Seneca, and Tuscarora. And uh, land claims originate back from this time. We call the Revolutionary War time period um, the whirlwind because what it did was it divided the way of life of the native people in this area. Um, under the Andanaga, Chief Joseph Brant in the Mohawk Valley, many of the Mohawk Nation went pro-British. Um, he was schooled in London, England through um, Sir William Johnson was his mentor and sent him to England to be educated. And when he came back to his longhouse people, he thought uh, along British lines. And um, a great rift was created in the longhouse way of life. And uh, during the Revolutionary War time period, we call this the whirlwind time period because um, it divided families just like the Civil War would later among the Europeans. It was often brother against brother and and it just ripped families to pieces. And some, uh, at Anadaga, um, at the Confederacy Council, the, the older and wiser elders and leaders and sachems of the Longhouse said, this is a war of the Europeans, it's not a native war. It's being fought on our territories, in our land, but let them do their thing, even if it's on our land. Don't let, we should not become involved in an alien war. But, for the first time in its thousands and thousands of years of traditional history, the longhouse was divided. And because of missionary influence under the Reverend Samuel Kirkland, the Oneida Nation went pro-colonist and uh, pro-American during the Revolutionary War. The Mohawk went um, pretty much pro-British. Um, my family that raised me, um, the Logans, there were two brothers at the time of the whirlwind. One got a captain's commission in the British Army and that half of the family lives on the Six Nations Reserve in Canada today. The other one was pro-American and helped save George Washington at Valley Forge, and they're on a dog in Syracuse. That's how close it is in, in the family that raised me right to this day. So that was a civil war among the people. A lot of uh, what they say in your history books is a lie. When they say, um, all the Iroquois sided with the British, and so that's why during the Revolutionary War incidents has happened, and this is why they're not with us anymore. I stand in front of a marker at Newtown Battlefield in Elmira, and um, it says, um, on the night of such and such, all that remained of this spot was the burned and charred ashes of the cabins and longhouse and the cornfields of the Iroquois that stood on this spot at Newtown. And um, it, it implies that the Iroquois are just no more, that they're like, now we make advance, and oh good, now we can get on with European civilization and enlightenment. And, manifest destiny that we're taught in our history books and now we're on to another deal. So, but of course, I'm standing in front of you tonight and, <laughs> well, you know. <laughs> so, I just took a trip to the Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., which is at the moment the most beautiful native museum in the country and I had the good fortune to be there three weeks ago. And uh, my my um, my tour guide at the museum was a full blood in in English you'd say Navajo. And, um, when my bus landed um, from the Tioga Point Museum, we were confronted with an immigration demonstration on the mile in front of the Smithsonian. 
and there were 500 people picketing for immigration and about 500 people against immigration. And so the comment was not was made by our tour guide. He said, well, I guess you know where I stand on this issue because I'm full-blooded native and uh, here I am. And then, well, look where you're all from. So this is a very interesting issue that has arisen. And um, I used to have a bumper sticker on my car when I was a real little militant creep back in the 60s, I guess. It said, Indians had bad immigration laws when I lived over here. <laughs> and, uh, so um, I thought about that bumper sticker from back 30 years ago when I was at the museum there three weeks ago. And uh, we all are, and we're all, we are truly, you know, a melting pot. And we all, I believe, have to try to do the best that we can with it. But um, as far as the Native people are concerned, that I know, um, they're still paying the price of your history. And uh, I was asked um, when 9-11 hit, what did I think? And I said, well, this is a really horrible event, and that's probably one of the worst events I'll hopefully ever live through within my lifetime. And this is horrible. So many of these unfortunate, really brilliant people that worked in these offices are not with us, and this is a horrible, horrible disaster. And the comment was made to me, well, this is the first time we've ever been attacked on American soil. And I said, well, maybe for you, but not for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so I said, um, you know, bioterrorism is nothing new to natives in the East. And being attacked in their own home, in their own country, is nothing new to America's first people. So I think when you put it in a historical perspective, it becomes much more meaningful to looking at from what you call an anthropology, an emic versus an edict viewpoint, which is an insider's viewpoint of their own culture versus an outsider's viewpoint and how you regard the culture or whatever culture you're studying that you're looking into. Um, the Cayuga Nation after the Revolutionary, Revolutionary War was uh, quite divided. And um, it was weakened and small in numbers after the whirlwind. Um, never really populous, like I said to begin with, it felt the brunt of General Sullivan's raid. Um, the destructions of its towns on Cuba Lake in this area from Cork Harganau, Scoyase, Goyac, uh Gandea, all the beautiful towns were in ashes. Um, the soldiers that came were mostly from New England, many of them. Um, in our towns here are direct descendants of uh, Sullivan soldiers um, who settled the territory. Um, they were quite upset that the, the farms and the fields that they were burning were superior than the ones that they were coming from in New England. That the homes of the Senecas were better constructed, that their corn was 20 inches long, and that their, uh, you know, Union Springs, um, Ganadote, they burned uh, and girdled 1,500 peach trees in that town. Um, and so um, those memories are very much a part of us today in the, in the Longhouse way of life. Um, it's like Pearl Harbor or anything. It's always remembered. And we, we always say our creator moves us on. But we do recall and we make sure that the kids understand their history and their culture history about that whirlwind time period. And uh, when the whirlwind subsided, the Cayuga Nation was uh, very different than it was before the war. Uh, Colonel Dearborn led the detachment that burned the east side of Cayuga Lake in the, in the uh, capital of the Cayuga Nation. On April 21, 1778, uh, Colonel Guzman Schock burned uh, the capital of the Six Nations the year before General Sullivan at Onondaga Castle. And um, in the oral traditional histories, not only do we know the exact date, but we know exactly what went down. And uh, when I was 14, um, I talked to somebody who was 85, who learned from when he was 10, somebody who was 90. And so it's handed down to me tonight. And so um, I'll give you a little version of two weeks ago, we had a big lecture at Syracuse University on the Onondaga Nation uh, laying claim against the city of Syracuse the way it stands tonight, and why. And so we had 900 people in the auditorium at Syracuse University three weeks ago. 
And so these things that I'm telling you are not like only 250 years ago they're telling me what what we're talking about. And um, at that time, one of my old history professors got up from 1975 in college, who was introducing Chief Irving Paulus Jr. from the Onondaga Nation. And uh, Irving is uh, 79 and has just suffered a stroke, but he's still teaching history in a wheelchair on the stage at Syracuse University because this is what our creator told us to do, to go out and disseminate and share the real history and the real way of life with everybody so that they appreciate it and understand it. Not to make them feel guilty that they're non-native or feel guilty about the history, but just to accept what the history is and to know what went on and to understand in the future so that your children and your grandchildren don't make the same mistakes. In our minds when bad dad was bombed and our minds were still going, he's living up to his name, hunted the guys by murdering these women and children in bad dad tonight. And so these things are actions and reactions that come back to haunt us on down through all these decades. And um, after after the war, after, after the Revolutionary War, um, many things happened. And one of them, my history teacher discussed, and he said, the history of the city of Syracuse began on this date with Colonel Bruce Michon. And at that time, Onondaga, Onondaga Castle, the capital of the Iroquois Confederacy, was burned. And at that time, um, all the log houses and cabins were burned in the Valley of the Onondaga. All the cornfields were burned, and everything was destroyed. And um, Colonel Colonel Guzman Schott's uh, soldiers gang raped 30 women, tore the unborn children from their bodies, and you could hear a hush the way he described this. I'm not going to go into the details here tonight. Over this crowd of Syracuse of these people, because they never knew what the city of Syracuse, where their European history really started. And I'm sure most of those professors and well-educated people that were sitting in the audience with me that night had never heard the truth before. And um, I had somebody sitting next to me going, did you know that? And I said, yes. And they said, well, um, my gal was sitting there next to me that night and she said, I've been with you 20 years and you never mentioned that. And I said, no, we don't talk about it. And, but we know it. And so we went out to supper and she said, what do you know about that day? And when we have that in there, it's just like it's yesterday. We don't have to read it in a history book. Um, it was in the morning, and uh, the women were singing their songs into their corn seeds, and they had their corn baskets, and they were playing their corn crops. And um, they have a song that they sing, their corn song, and they were blessing their seeds as they put the seeds in Mother Earth. And um, crows gave a warning. God God's crow. The crows gave the warning and flew up out of the out of the fields and all of a sudden the women looked up on the hill above the valley of the Onondaga and along Onondaga Creek and they looked up and they, uh, they saw the sun shining off the swords of the continental soldiers of the American troops and um, they heard the fife and drums and saw their tricornered caps and they heard their fifes and drums as they were beating and marched into the town and uh, to burn the town and uh, destroy everybody in it on orders from our first president. And uh, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. That's enough for you to understand that we have that exactly as it happened among the Iroquois tonight. And um, after the whirlwind subsided, um, it was 10 years before Grain Council was called to Onondaga. And when Grain Council was called, many, many um, people were no longer sitting on the benches in the long house. The leaders were dead, or the clan mothers made a decision, which we're paying for their mistake to this day. And they don't like me to hear that say that, but they made a big mistake back then, and we're still paying the price on every Native community in New York State for that. And the clan mothers, borrowed from other clans. Now when you belong to a clan and you're born in, like I said, into that clan by your mother, that's your genealogical bloodline. So if you're a Mohawk bearer and you fall for a girl that's Oneida bearer, you can't marry her because somewhere along the line you're related. And we don't want to have that happen, obviously. So there could be some physical consequences from that union. So we're very, in ancient times, they were very careful not to cross bloodlines. 
But after the Revolutionary War, there were benches in seats that were empty. And so they have amongst themselves what they call a condolence council. And when a, a condolence council are still called, and that means it's a wiping of the way of the tears. We're condoling the dead, we're grieving for them, and um, it's time for our claim mothers to install new leaders in the positions of the ones that have departed us. So what happened was, like, Robin is a wolf clan mother, and this fellow over here is a, is a bear, but what she did was she made him a wolf and put him in the, put him in the scene. But he's really a bear. He's not a wolf. And so the outgrowth of that now is the deformed children that we have with hands growing out of their elbows and genetic mess because it comes from the Revolutionary War. So our bloodlines are goofed up among the Iroquois somewhat in New York State and that's, that's another reason we're paying the price of General Sullivan tonight. And um, after it was done, um, we had uh, an interesting development because at that time, I'm just going to speak about this real briefly because I know I'm running over, I want to have a little time for question and answer here tonight. Um, after, after the war, um, the Constitution of the United States government, which is based on the great law of the Iroquois that you're all living under tonight, under Indian law, whether you know it or not, um, many of the principles are right from the, the great law um, that are in our Constitution. Yeah. The, um, the, um, the, the government was quite fractured among the Iroquois people, as well might be imagined. And, um, what they did was they signed a series of treaties for the Cayuga, it was the Cayuga, the Treaty of Cayuga Ferry at uh, Canoga in uh, 17, uh, 1785. Um, we had a series of treaties that were signed in the 1780s and 90s. Um, Canandaigua painted posts really got signed in Elmira, but the Treaty of Painted Post, Canandaigua, um, Fort Stanwix 1 and 2, um, Fort Harmer for the Ohio country, and, and all these treaties, land sessions were, were given. And um, in the case of the Cuban Nation, I went back at my own expense. I have spent many, many, many hundreds of hours in New York State court in the last four years uh, listening to testimonies of Cayuga clan mothers in uh, witness boxes in courtrooms, not in history classes in colleges, uh, where it should be, but in uh, state court in Syracuse and uh, federal court in Washington, D.C. on Cayuga Lake. And um, at my, my own expense, I'm kind of a poor guy, but I know my history, and uh, they uh, had a stagecoach breakdown, for, the, for instance, for the Cayuga Ferry Treaty. And it was, um, it was the law of the Constitution at the, of that time that the state of New York, um, the state of New York made sure that there was a, a witness from the federal government to ratify and legalize the Cuga Lake treaties. And um, a wheel or something broke down on the stagecoach and the, the federal government representative was like a day late getting to Cuga Lake. And so the state of New York said, we paid him some money and we paid him some goods and services and um, don't breathe a word of this ever and we'll just pretend this is legal and shove it under the rug and it got shoved under the rug for 220 years. And uh, so um, in, the, in the case of the Cayugas, from the Cayuga viewpoint, all the treaties that are in regards to the 64,500 acres of the northern end of Cayuga Lake, which have been under Cayuga Indian land claim for the last 20 years, and the $250 million that was awarded in state court by uh, Judge McCurn in front of me to the Cuban Nation um, was void on, on what they call latches in, um, in legal terms, which means that there is no statute of limitations legally on how long that went on from the day the treaty was signed. And so from 1795 until tonight, we have an interesting situation in regards to not particularly Tompkins County in general, but all the territory uh, surrounding, especially the northern end of Cuba Lake in uh, Seneca Falls, Waterloo area, and uh, some of you probably have relatives up on the area. And
you know, time doesn't permit me to go into all the details of this, um, but in question and answer, maybe we'll get a little a little time. I want to go back to my mother and do one last thing for her and her memory before I do get that question and answer period. Has anybody heard to you the language in this room ever? Well, this is the first language of this county. So it's about time to get a little bit of it. Um, this is a reel-to-reel -reel tape that I really need redone. And um, my mother did this for me in an, an American folklore class in college in 1974. And uh, everybody in my college class, and it was a class in uh, American folklore, and everybody did, you know, things like the Loomis Gang and all these different ones, you know. And so I went back and I asked her if she would uh, do me a big favor. And what she did was, in the ancient Cuga language, the story of the creation of the Cuga language in the ancient Cuga language. So, for about five minutes, even though you don't understand a word of what's being said, this is the story of the creation of the world in the ancient Cuga language, the very introduction. And I just thought it would be neat for some of you to hear a little bit of Cuga because you probably haven't heard it. So here we go, Gal. birds flying up in the air there and she's talking about wings of birds meeting each other and sky woman falling on the and, uh, of the wings of the birds and there's a turtle floating in the water and the whole world is all water underneath her and the birds are holding up at the insect the sky woman and she's going to become first woman on mother earth and it's a very beautiful creation story it's very lengthy so on that I just wanted to give a little bit of that um, the Cayuga Nation today uh, has members that reside on the Cattaraga Seneca Reservation. Actually, there's a few members on every, I don't like the word reservation, territory is better. And, uh, and you're on these land bases in New York. The bulk are on the Cattaraga Seneca uh, land um, in Gowanda, New York, just south of the uh, city of Buffalo. Um, there are some on the Tonawanda uh, area uh, near Batavia. Um, the, the largest component of Cuban Nation people are in on the Six Nation Reserve in uh, Oshawigan, Ontario, Canada, 60 miles west of Niagara Falls, which has groups from all the original Six Nations plus 22 other native groups represented on that particular reserve area. And uh, we do have uh, a group of Seneca Cayuga in, uh, in northeastern Oklahoma, in Grove, Oklahoma, in the Miami uh, Northeast area of the Osage. So, um, they're on both sides of the border and in Oklahoma and um, we have we had some really illustrious Cayuga people um, I have in my lifetime a uh, really very good close uh, lawyer friend in Toronto that's Cayuga um, my my uh, gal's college advisor was from Six Nations whose mother was full blood Cayuga uh, she was an advisor at Tompkins Cortland Community College after I left there worked for the Native American Studies uh, group at Cornell University, and um, so we have a we have a lot of very illustrious Cayuga people. They have made their mark on every single um, endeavor in non-native society that there is. They uh, they have they have uh, shown incredible fortitude and talent, and have mastered the the native world and the non-native world as lawyers, doctors, dentists, and Cayugas in every profession that there is that you can imagine. And um, so, uh, <clears throat> hopefully, um, in the future, um, from my angle at least, that um, somewhere, I, I'm hoping, I've been here 50 years waiting, I have a very good friend tonight named Dan Hill, he's a flute player, 
and he's residing on the Shear farm tonight in a house who's the first Cayuga person to be on his home territory in the land of his ancestors since the night General Sullivan's raid burned his great 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 grandmother's and father's home there on that farm where that farm is. And um, I'm very proud to have known Dan in my life and is still a good friend. And um, uh, we have ceremonies there. And uh, we go back up into that sacred gorge and we have prayer ceremonies there. And um, in that world that Father, uh, Father Menard wrote about in his Jesuit relations of 1656, that waterfall, still has that water going over that ledge and in my mind I can still see exactly what he saw he said I've never met a more happy race of people on the face of the earth and they love their children and 20 inch speckled trout flopped into the boys and girls arms underneath the waterfalls they didn't need a fishing pole the sky was blackened in the sky they said like Midnight at high noon from the millions of the passenger pigeons flying over the head and the sky was blacked out for hours at a time and we must remember that there's not one single one left they're totally gone those passenger pigeons when I was a little boy I went to the state museum and what a beautiful little great bird they are and I looked at this little stuffed gray passenger pigeon in that case and thought about all those millions of those birds floating over Cayuga Lake and I felt sorry for the birds and was hoping the Cayuga wouldn't go that route. Tonight, I can guarantee you they're not going to. So I'm very happy about that. And with that, I'd like to say, uh, Danejo, so some of my words. And, uh, Yahweh. Thank you very much, Robin, for letting me come and share these few minutes in my old honey grounds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I talked real briefly about a whole bunch of things, um, so let's open it up to questions and answers. Whatever any folks here have something on your mind, a specific issue about history or whatever it is, and don't feel bad if you want to shake me and murder me, whatever. It's okay. It's not Judy. Well, I wondered if you could just give us a few words about what went on in particular in the Okay. Um, right in Newfield Village in particular, there, there, there have been. Um, to my knowledge, there have been no burials. Um, the route here on Route 13 along the edge of the trail, the, the road here, this halfway up the hill here where Route 13 bisects right through, through where it was is a pre-Iroquoian stone quarry for making arrowheads. And where you see the little um, deposits of stone right next to Route 13, when I was a boy, there was no Route 13. And so um, we, this was the main road in front of my house when I was a boy. And so um, we would climb up there and uh, my uncle could find arrowheads up in there because that was an actual site. And I don't know if that was uh, Cayuga or if that was, I, I would venture to say that's probably pre-Iroquois, another culture. But um, uh, in any event, where this went through, where the road goes through here is part of the old Sullivan Trail. and. Um, after Colonel Dearborn burned uh, Buttermilk Falls and on their way back from burning the towns like Cougar Castle on the east side of the lake, they came back down through here. And this area right around Newfield Village is described in the Sullivan Diaries as an impenetrable wilderness of tangled bushes. And I guess the soldiers, um, they weren't all here. General Sullivan and his campaign had 4,500 soldiers, American troops, against the Longhouse at that time. And um, not all 4,500 came through Newfield, but a detachment of them did. And they came right along about where, I don't know where we are actually, because the old, this was the main road when I was a kid, so right through the middle of Newfield Village, I imagine. Um, General Sullivan's army camped um, in Ithaca on the side of the old Ithaca Hotel, which is, I guess, I, I don't know what it is now, a parking lot, I'm trying to remember. But um, uh, the, the largest, um, the, the, the group that would, that stayed here the longest were the Saponi and the Saponi people from Pony Hollow. And then the Tudelo came here and the Tudelo were adopted at Buttermilk Falls. Today their ancestors uh, reside on the Six Nations Reserve in Canada. And um, we still have Tudelo people and they um, 
they lost a lot of their language and ceremonies, but um, there's there's still a, a bloodline in there, and um, there is for Saponi too. And uh, how much I, I'm not sure at this point, but um, we remember them, and we remember them in a ceremony called Kahana Bayang Santas, which is the spirit adoption ceremony of the Tudalo people in Ashwigan, Canada, which is written by Frank Speck, a very famous ethnologist and anthropologist, and the ceremony, to my knowledge, is still performed. There's a certain section of the reserve called New Credit at Six Nations. And so um, that's the most I can remember about New Field. Do you know anything particular. about those caves out in Boney Hall? Um, I, I don't. I, I've heard legends about it. I've never been able to verify anything about it. Um, it's very possible. It's very possible. I don't know, but it could be. Yes, anybody, let's go. Next, quick. Yes? Um, what was General Sullivan's first name? John. John. He was from New Hampshire. He was buried in New Hampshire. And um, we don't call him John, like I said. We call him Honey the Guys. We call all Europeans to this day um, Hatshani. And Hatshani in Iroquois means long knife from General Sullivan's swords. And uh, I'm down Elmira Way, and they put in a Sullivan exhibit in the uh, Shaman County Historical Society. And they had a Sullivan soldier's sword that was found on the ground of the Battle of Newtown on exhibit at the museum. And I could feel the vibration coming out of it. And it uh, was lost by a trooper. And, and I said, uh, I can tell this sword had a pumpkin hanging on it. And uh, I had a friend with me, and he went, what? And I said, one of the soldiers feared a pumpkin in a pumpkin patch in Newtown with this and then threw it into a cabin and that's what they did. They took the card and they threw it into the cabins and then burned everything. And then uh, I said, but this guy lost his sword. This thing had a pumpkin on it at one time, I think. And uh, so um, when I was a boy working for the uh, museum in Auburn, um, Professor Long, who was the head of the director of the Cuga County Museum for 50 years, I worked him, with him for about almost 20 out of this 50 there. Uh, on different native projects with my mother and um, I was called back in a weird situation. He passed away while I was working in Connecticut and I felt really bad about him passing because he wrote me three months before he passed a beautiful resume and in this resume was things that I had done when I was a kid in Newfield and was, was going at it and uh, so I, uh, I had forgotten some of these nice things, you know, of course Barbara will tell you all the bad things about me. But <laughs> she only lifts her doors for me, so she said, you really want to get the true scoop, guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and there's another one over there that can tell you a little bit, too. But uh, <laughs> I'm trying to be professional, but um, it's funny. And uh, so, um, anyway, um, in the museum in Auburn is a small corn husk doll. And that doll had no identification with it because after I left, I don't know what happened, but Professor Long passed away in any of that and whoever took over sure did a mess because the whole American Indian Native American collection had no identification to it. So I was called back for a few hours by a very close friend and they said, boy, Roy, we could really use your help at the museum and we can't pay you anything, which is just so typical. So I'm so happy about Robin tonight. But anyway, <laughs> so, so anyway, so anyway, they called me back to the museum and um, they, call, they called me back and uh, I, I was able to spend three, I, I said, I'll give you two hours. I ended up spending four. And I did as much identification of artifacts for the museum as I could recall because my mother had bought most of them and I was the last living one to know who the artists were they were purchased from and what reserve they were from and a great so I gave them as much information as I could but one of the things that came out of a tomato paste box was a cornhouse doll and uh, I said I need to hold the doll in my hand and so they said sure here you go and um, that doll is the uh, to my knowledge anyway is the uh, very last surviving material item from General Sullivan's campaign raid. And um, what happened with this little doll was it was found in the village of Newtown, down near Shemung and Laumann, down here in Elmira, um, as the army was marching into the town 
um, they found it in front of a cabin, and uh, a fellow from Sullivan's New Hampshire regiment picked up the doll and put it in his backpack and took it to his little girl in New Hampshire from a Seneca. And um, that little doll got handed down for five generations until it came home to Cayuga country. And um, when I held it, I could see in my mind what happened. And um, they, the corn soup kettles were still boiling full of soup. And uh, you got to remember at that time that no, no Iroquois, the world that Iroquois believed in and lived in at that time in the spring of 1779 was a beautiful, beautiful world here. And all the boys were out playing lacrosse in April and nobody realized that by August their world would be gone as they knew it. And so this little girl had played with this doll and as the American soldiers were marching into the town to destroy it, um, her mother grabbed in front of a cabin and she just accidentally dropped the doll until it was picked up by that soldier and it went, it went down like five generations in the family until it came home to Cuba County close to us anyway but we have all, we have very little material things left from the Sullivan Way because of course most everything was burned when I was in Cooperstown about three years ago we went down to the longhouse on the way yes and the gentleman that was conducting the interviews down there I asked him why there wasn't uh, any of the uh, Six Nations archives in the museum up on the building. He said if they put them there, then the Six Nations could claim them. So that's why the ones that were there were from out west or whatever and were not there. Could you speak on that? Yes. Um, in 1990, the federal government passed uh, a federal law called the Native American Religious Freedom Act. That that law, for the first time in the history of the United States, made Native American religion officially legal. And so I always found it a little interesting that all the Europeans came here for freedom of religion, totally suppressed the Native religion to the point where for over six generations they had to go underground and continued, but in public was really not allowed to be spoken about until 1990. And I believe it was like in 1991, they passed the American, uh, what we call NADPRA, Native, Native American Graves and Protection Act. And it began what we call repatriation in museum collections. And for the first time in history, what Native Americans themselves deem sacred to them as part of their religious ceremonies under federal government law of the United States must be returned to their respective nations. And so all the museums are having a hard time with it. They have since the law was implemented because we have a big controversy. Put Roy in the middle of a big controversy because Roy has both. Roy has total Native American background and thought process both in language, culture, and religion. But he also has a Bachelor of Arts degree in uh, anthropology. And so um, sometimes there's a conflict of interest in regards to museums and um, material culture regarding those issues. But in any event, um, the NAGPRA Act, what the NAGPRA Act did was what you're discussing. And what it did was um, certain things are regarded as sacred, whether they're in the hands of the Native people now or not. One of the things that are really sacred in the ongoing religion to all Iroquois right now are what we call Gagonsa or Hadoi masks. In English they were called false faces because they misinterpret it. But these masks are um, not just a wooden mask that are worn in the longhouse in their sacred ceremonies, but they're in, what, in their religion they're imbued with special power that they believe is for natives only. And um, uh, through different arrangements, some of these items over the years either fell into the hands of private collectors or they were sold off by other natives into collectors' hands. There was a time in like the early 1900s when the Iroquois people themselves dispersed a lot of their culture because they felt that their culture was dying out so fast that they weren't going to be around anymore. And so some of these things they put in the hands of museums believing that even if physically we are no longer with you, at least we, you can remember us that since we're all going to be gone, that was really the mentality. And uh, so a lot of things left the hands of the native people that shouldn't have. And some of the things that left are um, still very sacred things like um, 
in longhouse ceremonies, material culture things, um, water drums, turtle rattles, medicine masks, um, certain condolence canes, and cer certain material culture. And museums had large collections. The Museum of the American Indian in New York City, uh, the Rochester Museum of Arts and Sciences during the WPA days and the Depression days. Dr. Parker was a direct descendant of the of Red Jacket, and uh, Rochester had no really nice museum building. And in the middle of the Depression, Dr. Parker was a quarter Seneca, and he came in and was uh, left the State Museum in Albany after the fire in early 1900, where he had spent most of his life collecting up material culture from different reserve areas in New York State. And he had over um, 5,000 Iroquois items in the State Museum. And uh, I think it was in October of 1911, the State Museum burned. And Dr. Parker lived about three blocks from the museum at that time. And he actually had to be physically removed from the State Museum burning because he would have burned up alive. He, 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 his people had regarded him very highly. And um, he was never really the same after that. But um, they did save about a little less than a quarter of the original collection. But unfortunately, the bulk of the collection burned. And then he came to Rochester. And um, Bosch and Lamb, the optometrist, the eyeglass fellas, um, Mr. Uh, Bosch came into his office. And the museum was in a very poor section of Rochester in 1935. And uh, he said, I understand the city of Rochester is needing a really nice facility for its history. And I feel that you're the man. And here's a check for a million dollars. Go build your museum for the city of Rochester. And so Dr. Parker built all the exhibits himself to his specifications in the city of Rochester Museum. And they're there to this day. When you walk in the front doors of the Rochester Museum, here are his beautiful, beautiful ornithology and bird exhibits and the cases that Dr. Parker designed himself with that money are still there today for us. And when I was a little boy, we took a school trip from here in Newfield to the State Museum in Albany. And uh, I was interested in different things, you know, and I had a little curtain there, you know, and there's rocks behind there that glow, you know, and you can they light up when you pull the curtain. And uh, so I was very interested in the minerals and, and things. But Dr. Parker's Iroquois exhibit, of course, was the one that did it for me. And uh, when I was a little boy, those dioramas are no longer there, unfortunately. And uh, there were scenes from each one. And each one, oh. Wow. <laughs> the creator said, let there be light. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, so each, each one of uh, those exhibits are dismantled now. But when I was a kid, I stood there fixated because I knew that when I was looking at the Seneca honey scene, that that was Canandaigua Lake in the background. And when I was looking at the Cayuga fault space ceremony going on at Midwinters, that was Cayuga Castle because that's Cayuga Lake in the background. I knew that. And what he did was he took not only the exact spot where the incident occurred, but he also took life-size molds. And he would take like this fella here in this striped shirt, and he'd be a full-blood Seneca. And he'd say, i got to find one that looks like a real Seneca. And that guy fit the belt, and so he made like these plaster mold casts of his whole body. And they had these beautiful dioramas set up because they were direct descendants of the real to get the physical structures in. And uh, so uh, the, uh, the Oneida Nation Museum out on the 32 acres in Oneida, New York, has a little museum called the Shigawi uh, Museum out at Oneida, New York. And the Oneida have back the State Museum exhibit that was there when I was a kid as part of their collection. I don't know where the rest are, maybe dismantled and something. But anyway, that's what repatriation is. Repatriation is uh, what the fe what, not what the federal government, but what different Native nations deem is sacred of a religious nature to them. And because they have never lost their religions, some of those items have gone away. And it's a, a government, a federal law that what they deem sacred must be repatriated back to their nations if they can show that the ceremony itself is ongoing and that it hasn't broken its continuum. Is there any booklet that shows where these museums are that you can go and visit in New York State? Um, check your local libraries. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, the library in Ithaca. And uh, here in New York State, I can tell you some of the best ones. Um, we have uh, in Salamanca, New York, on the uh, Allegheny Reservation, we have the Seneca Iroquois National Museum in the city in Salamanca, uh, which is on Route 17 out here, uh, just south of Buffalo. We have. Um, Oh, let me think here. Um, 
Help me out. You've been to all of them. Okay. Uh, the um, the Mohawk uh, Kahnawaga Museum, which is run by um, the they're not Jesuit. What are they? Help me out. The fathers down there. Do you know? Anyway, it's the the uh, Kateri yes. the Kateri Takakwita Shrine yeah. in Fonda, um, and that's a, uh, a museum near Johnstown. Mm -hmm. We have the um, a really very good one, very remote and kind of hard to get to, but worth the trip. Um, the Six Nations Museum in Anchiota, New York, which is up near uh, Paul Smith College, oh. right next to Paul Smith College. Yeah, on Chiota, New York. Where is that? Um, oh, the lake. What's the lake? Tupper Lake. Thank you. Thank you. Tupper Lake area. Um, we have the uh, the Akwesasne Nation Museum on uh, Akwesasne Reserve in Hogansburg, New York, which is up near Messina on the, on the Mohawk Reserve. Um, we have no, we have nothing on Gaga, unfortunately. Um, and my mother's is gone, so we don't have anything. <coughs> Right here. It's a project that Roy wants to work on, in fact, so, you know, to get something back in its old territories. Yes, sir. We can keep you here for the next three hours, but I have a tough question for you. Sure. Why is the Native Americans throughout the United States chosen to use casinos as a means of earning revenue? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I know. It's not an easy one for me to answer because I, mean, uh, I don't know about a lot of other nations, to be honest. Um, in our old religion, gambling is frowned upon. And um, in, in the 1800s, we, uh, we were, the Iroquois were in really bad shape. And it was said that like 70% of their women were alcoholic after Sullivan's raid. And the despondency and the suicide rate was huge. And there was just like, just hopelessness and helplessness and no hope to go on on any level. And so um, a prophet arose among them. And in England, his name is Gannett Daniel. In English, his name is Handsome Light. And he was a reformed alcoholic who had a series of visions. And in one of these visions, he started what we call the new religion in the longhouse. And his word went to all native people in New York State. And he was an incredible visionary and drew the people out of that pit that they were in and made them flower in their minds again. And he's buried across from the longhouse at Onondaga and died on a trip as like a, what you'd call a, a mission in 1815. But one of the things that Handsome Lake spoke against is gambling and the use of cards. And it's regarded as a vice of the Europeans that if the native people accept it wholeheartedly, that it will lead to the destruction of the longhouse way of life. So right in their old religion and in their new religion both, there's a problem with gambling. And it has created, um, at least in New York State, a civil war on every Native American reserve. Many of the people who have accepted it are like, um, you know, millionaires overnight. They've got the new cars, the new homes, the new whatever, okay? And like you might accept it, but your brother doesn't. And he's still living in a beat up trailer and a tire paper shack or whatever. And so we've got huge problems in civil war among casino issues. And um, I was surprised, to be honest, that Allegheny even got it. But uh, there's, there's, uh, like in any modern day society, um, there's corruption in the government, oh, yeah. there's corruption in the chiefs, and uh, I'm the first to say, it's sometimes who greases whose palm that gets what's done here said but true. And um, we, um, we have huge factions among the Oneida Nation about Turning Stone Casino. Um, among their own families, we have, um, we have family member against family member who until recent years, we're very close that won't look or speak to one another over these issues now. Um, and it's very, it's very tough. So it's, it's very tough. So not all Indians accept it. Not all natives accept it. Some natives do, some natives don't. And so um, that's the best I can do with that. So. What about the Lamotas? Oh, yes. Um, uh, the, what we call in uh, the, uh, a question arose here about the Lamoka people. The Lamoka culture complex is, uh, we really don't know. We call them Lamoka, which is again a, a misnomer because the Lamoka, the Lam we call it Lamoka Lake. And it's over here in Schuyler County near Watkins Glen on the other side. And that was the largest of their three town sites that have been excavated and discovered. Um, they, they're pre-Iroquoian. They're not part of the Iroquoian Confederacy. They're an ancient culture. And um, we don't know a whole lot.
about them, even their name or anything, except when we come upon them, we can identify them as Lamokin from their, um, their skeletal remains and from the material culture that they did leave behind. Lamoka Lake was excavated in, um, in four, four seasons beginning in 1925, in the summer of 1925, under the state archaeologist at that time, uh, William Ritchie and his predecessors. And um, at the Lamoka Lake site, over 2,400 artifacts were excavated within a three-acre area. Um, it's a very rich site. It still is, um, probably. And uh, uh, there's two other sites besides that one on Lamoka, but the, they call it Lamoka because it's the largest site that's been excavated. Yes, sir. Right. When they excavated the island at the North End of Cuba, didn't they somehow tie that with the Lamokan culture? I, I believe so. I believe there was some kind of component over that there, yeah. But it's earlier. It's, it's 5000 BC. Yeah. So you've got to remember that a lot of these sites are in layers, the in geographical and topographical layers that, you know, this is, the, this is the new one on top, is 1600, but three layers down you're going to run into 1100 or whatever, and so a lot of town sites are built over one another. We've got a site here in uh, Tioga Point. Tioga Point in Sarah Athens is a very rich, with many, many, many centuries upon centuries of native habitation, and um, the latest one is what we call Queen Esther's Town, which was burned by Colonel Hartley in August of 1778, but um, she was a sister to Queen Esther Montour over here in Watkins Glen fame. But um, uh, underneath her town are pre Iroquois sites. And uh, so a lot of them, like say Shashik went across the river. I was at a market selling a couple of months ago. A fellow came up to me and he goes, uh, you know about natives, huh? And I said, oh, a little bit. And he said, uh, you know, I read books. And he, <laughs> and he, said, uh, and he says, uh, I have a farm. And he said, uh, on this farm, he said, we were digging with our backhoe on our farm, and all of a sudden up came all these stone hatchet heads and skulls and trade beads and all this stuff in our dumpster. And I said, oh, oh boy. And uh, don't tell, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> and I said, no, only kidding. I said, what, what did you do? And he said, we were, we were in the process of selling the farm. And so I said, oh, my God. And he goes, um, well, we wanted to sell it. So I said, well, what would you do with the burials? And he said, uh, we picked them out of the out of the machinery and put them back and buried them as best we could. And I said, well, how many did you excavate and how many did you dig up? And so he said, uh, well, we, we got a hold of about 20 of them, about 19 of them are there. And uh, I said, that's a lot for that time period. So I said, uh, there's only one place that you could have hit that many in this immediate area. And that's uh, like Queen Esther's Town or right near it. So you must have hit on the nation cemetery or something. And um, he said, well, we put them all back. It's a Shashik one across the river from her town. So I said, okay. So um, the people that own the farm now know? He goes, no, we never told. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, well, you have to be really careful now because these are, these are things that um, are very, very touchy issues to Native American people. They're also touchy issues to the state of New York, and they're also touchy issues to your federal government. And there are very big fines imposed upon you as a United States citizen if you don't try to do the right thing. And you can do the right thing, and there's nothing, there's no problem with it, okay? So you don't, you don't have to keep this all hush-hush and secret because it can all be worked out. A lot of it is kept secret only because of money because burials are hit on like when a highway is going through. Uh, next month, two months, months ago down in Elmira, they were digging out Nauman Interchange and all of a sudden they hit on a, a town site in Elmira there. And so uh, generally what we do in these instances is we contact whatever current nation um, would be a direct descendant of the people that are in the burials, if we can possibly do that. And then we bring them down, and we make sure that they're properly reburied, um, or they're taken back on the reservation and reburied, whatever the chiefs see fit to do. But um, when they're disturbed in our ancient religion, we feel that once that the body itself has been dug up, that it has um, stopped the spirit from being in the spirit world the way it wants to be, dancing with the Creator. And so we have what we call so we still have gosh, and it's a tobacco burning ceremony, and we, we have a prayer service for those who came before us, and then we decide what we can do with them. 
but we do we do need to have a prayer service for them because they're they're not just something that are a bunch of trash there are direct relation back there so we don't think about it as just because they're Lamolka and they're not really part of us they they are part of us so if we dig up a Lamolka we call a Seneca because that's in the ancient Seneca territory and so we need the Senecas to come back and have a religious service for that burial yes was so buddy. <laughs> he made it through the potato famine, but he didn't so great there, so. <laughs> yes. Uh, we had the pleasure of being on the Amada when I was at the museum. Yes. And it's beautiful. Yes. Yeah. It really is. It's yeah. very, very nice. Yep. Yeah. And then you have... Watch it. Uh, and they have beautiful changing exhibits and they have wonderful explanations there about the role that the Oneidas played in the forming of America. You know, it was Polly Cooper, uh, who was an Oneida, a lot of people don't know Oneida history. Uh, Polly Cooper was an Oneida woman who um, took the bushels of corn to George Washington's soldiers at Valley Forge and saved the Revolutionary War. So had it not been for an Oneida, the revolution, you might all be speaking really good English tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. You're fortunate six to be adapted uh, uh, into really a different culture. Yes. How did that, how did, how did that happen? How, how, why you? Okay. Um, sometimes I wonder too, but I, uh, I was, uh, I was very small and I was at um, Alaska Lake. Um, and I had already been to Onondaga and knew quite a few people. My uncle, who lived in this house over here with us during the summer, was very good about history. And when I was little, he would, um, I was a really weird child. And when I, <laughs> she'll tell you, she'll tell you too, I was a weird kid. And, uh, and uh, so, um, Barbara will vouch for that, look at her laugh. And uh, so will Jimmy. <laughs> and, uh, so um, my uncle, who was uh, pretty weird in a lot of ways, right, Judy? Um, oh, he was a good guy. Yeah, he was a good guy, but he had his moments. And um, my, my uncle had a, was very psychic, actually. And what happened was they lived on Long Island, and um, my grandmother told me this story as a little kid. And um, my, my uncle slept during the day because he worked nights. And um, all of a sudden, the door opened up one afternoon about 2 o'clock and he came down the steps and walked out the house and my grandmother was sitting there like in the living room she said Al where are you going and um, so he didn't look at her and he went out in the yard and got in the driveway and backed out the driveway and left and he was gone like I don't know one or two hours and my grandmother said Roy I was going to call the police on your uncle Al because he just <laughs> left well this was that not so unusual for this guy actually and uh so anyway, he came back in a couple hours and he was just drenched. He was like soaked right through. And he opened up the door and my grandmother said, oh my God, I was just about to call the cops. And where have you been? And he never looked at her. And he goes back up the steps and shuts the bedroom door. And about five minutes later, this banging comes on the door and this woman stands there. And she goes, where's that man that we followed to this house? Where is he? I have to talk to him. And she said, well, I think that you're talking about my son. He just came in like drenched. So she said, what's going on? And she said, my family was having a picnic down at Jones Beach. And um, I have a little boy that's five, and he wandered into the surf, and the, 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 he was being pulled out by the surf and was drowning. And this man appeared out of nowhere and just walked out into the ocean and picked up my child and brought him back on the beach and got in his car and came to this house. And so I, it's kind of in there. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, to make a long story short, what, what was the question? <laughs> oh, how did I start? How did I start? Well, okay. So she must have seen I was a little weird or something because what happened was Miss Logan was sitting at a table uh, raising funding for the uh, Auburn Museum for the building of this Indian village that she helped reconstruct that I ended up working and staying in. And, uh, and, um, I had a suitcase of beadwork and different crafts there, and I've always been a craftsman and artist, and so I had some of my work, and I was like six years old, and Professor Long brought me over to her, and he said, this is Roy, and Roy has been around Onondaga, and he's been around, but he's never met you, and she was really tough, this gal was really tough, and she said, um, and, and, uh, 
Professor Lon said he'd like to show you some of his crafts and workmanship. So she said, okay. And I had a little gray suitcase with a metal edge rim on it. And um, uh, so I opened it up and she took out this beadwork and she went like this with it, you know, she's like fingering it. Well, it's not bad considering. It's not as good as like what I make or what my people make, but it's not bad considering. And Roy had a true Indian German personality. My last name is Shrek, and uh, <laughs> my father was a, a lot of people don't know, but my father was, a, I'm a direct descendant of a paid killer of German Hessian mercenary soldiers <laughs> pre Revolutionary War. So I have this little temper problem. And um, so anyway, I took the lid of the suitcase and I slammed it right across her hands with her knuckles in it and said, Nobody's asking you need to buy it. <laughs> and my father only came home on the weekends and he grabbed me, I can still feel like, grabbed me by the back of the neck and how dare you do this and you're going to be severely reprimanded and oh boy I can feel it now and uh, and so she said wait a minute, wait a minute, she said what's your name and he said uh, Shrek and uh, like the movie <laughs> and uh, so, boy I hate it though, <laughs> he said, he said, uh, he says, uh, um, He's going to be severely reprimanded. And she said, wait a minute, wait a minute. And he said, um, she said, where do you live? Where do you live, sir? And he said, well, they live south of Ithaca. And I'm just getting home on the weekends because I work in Pennsylvania. And I come home to see the boys. I had a brother 10 years older. And I only come home to see him on the weekends. And she, he said, but that's it. He's really in trouble. And all he started writing on. And she goes, wait a minute, wait a minute. She said, I'm a very busy woman. I work for the State Museum in Albany. I work, I work for Mayor Lee Alexander in Syracuse. I, 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 I work for the city of Syracuse for the Parks and Recreation Department, and I have 15 city parks under me during the summer and eight craft wagons that I do, and she's telling my dad what she's doing. And she said, but with him, I need you to bring him to my house on the reservation and spend one hour with me. And he said, you can hand me for whatever I want. I get this kid. And uh, so, so, um, so, I went, and that one hour ended up being the most important hour in my life, up to my 53 years I'm standing in front of you now. And out of that one hour came the whole deal. And um, she taught me everything I know about that part. Uh, you know, whatever, whatever good I do, it, I owe it to her. And um, she saw to it that I got my college degrees and that I went right straight through. And that was pretty hard coming from what I came from. Right, Judy? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I had a rough time in feel growing up some of it. And there's some people in here that will tell you it wasn't always the easiest road for Roy. <laughs> and uh, um, so um, out of that one hour, I ended up going to her house for that one hour. And I never left the reservation in the summertime. I was always there with her. And I stayed right there at her home and learned everything that I could. And I lived at Onondaga for uh, 20 summers until I buried her with the chiefs. And, and then I was with her brother and buried him next to her. So I really grew up at Onondaga, yes. I just wanted to say, because he isn't going to say it, that he does the most beautiful deed work you can imagine. And it's as good as any any Indians work out of the scene. It's oh, beautiful. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I didn't bring any. I thought I would do this. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting a reprieve tonight because I'm still selling. Yeah. You know, it's 50 years of selling. So, yes, sir. I have visited your mother's village here that you showed At Owasco Lake? That's a lot. There anymore, is it? No. Um, she passed away, uh, very sad, in 19... She passed in 1978, and then the museum took it over, and uh, she conducted um, activities every weekend for 25 years there, and plus during the weeks too. And we had some of the best in the world come to that site. We had, uh, uh, wow, Louis Bruce, who was Commissioner of Indian Affairs, and all the different chiefs. We had lacrosse games, craft workshops, we had history lectures, we had everything in the world there over the years. And after she passed away, it was never the same. That was her baby, and um, I was asked by the museum to take it over. And um, in true Nina fashion, it's kind of sad, but I said, you know, that was her work and that was her life. And I'll never be able to live up to her, even though she raised me. I'm not her. I have to go out and do my own thing. And so, um, I, I, and I have 
to an extent. But uh, unfortunately, uh, the land claims came in very strong into Cuga County. And the Cuga County Legislature saw fit rather than to extend the money to the Cuga Museum, um, which the Indian Village was part of the Cuga Museum itself, that the money went towards the Agricultural Museum and they wanted to build a boat launch there on that archaeology site. And so the city of Auburn came in and uh, destroyed the log cabins and the village and the locals got in there and very much, like I'm very sad to say about some things that happened here when I was living here for our new field, Sesquicentennial, some of the, well, we call how bad our covered bridge and what shape it was in and how we really had to fight to, in our history to get our covered bridge in the, the good shape it's in tonight. And uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen with her. And um, some of the locals got in and, and broke the display cases and, oh and the museum and the whole Indian village was bulldozed under for a boat launch for the city of Auburn. So, I heard yeah. one time in a house, still, I mean, hundreds of arrowheads and stuff. Thousands. What became of those? I, I have no idea, sir. I, I, oh, I, oh, really? I, I actually was working in Connecticut at a time when it was demolished, and I was here for her funeral, and then I got at work in Connecticut, and I was living down in Connecticut when all this went on, and when I came back, the deed had been done. But the Great Gully, I visited that site. It was, did the people live in the gully? No, on the, rims? the people lived on the rims. Okay. Upper Cayuga, East Cayuga, the towns were on both sides of the gorge at different time periods and at the upper end. And um, um, the monuments that are there, like to the missionaries and everything, are there, and the burial grounds are there. And everything. It's really interesting that the fellow that owns the farm that's on the site is uh, not like a lot of the others. He's very receptive toward Native Americans, and he actually allows us to come and have prayer ceremonies on, on his farm. And um, Great Gully is used as a prayer center, and um, we have what we call um, the uh, Handsome Lake. Um, actually, it's what we call the Peacemakers, the Peacemakers Journey. And in English, his friend you would call Hiawatha, A A and Wentha, and the Peacemaker. And each, each, every, I don't know, four years or something, they actually take the trail that Onondaga Chief Hiawatha, that founded the Iroquois Confederacy and the peacemaker traveled across the state of New York. And when it comes to the Cugas, there's no like reserved land until now. So we use Great Gully as the spot for the Cuga Nation. That's their most sacred place. So um, I think probably we better bring this to a close. All right. If anybody has any more questions, and they, you, are you willing to answer them sure. privately? Sure. OK, we want to thank you very much, Roy. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. And there's refreshments downstairs in the room in the back of the library. That's where we got to open questions. And that's right. Anyone come to your meeting? Of course. I was going to come one time and then I thought, no, I don't know. I don't know.